welcome what are our simple basic needs food clothing and shelter and covid 19 has refreshed our memories on that we started our simple talks on the world environment day 5th june 2020 we have been bringing you critical thinkers who have also been actively involved in the field engaging with the communities at the grassroots level we started with biodiversity the very essential of life on earth water the elixir of life agriculture your food waste recycling to conserve the resources and now we are addressing your shelter i welcome all of you on our simple talks 12 this series of four talks is titled natural building materials and technologies and we are starting with the most fundamental material mud mud has been the most essential building material since the dawn of man the mud construction uses only simple natural materials which is digging soil from the earth mixing with water and added up with paddy or hay or any dried fiber or even recycling garbage today we have with us dr yogananda a structural engineer and architect chitra vishwanath who have been continuously working with this humble material breaking several myths and barriers welcome to our talk sir welcome chitra we have with us dr professor janjeev sanjeev singh dean planning and development school of planning and architecture bhopal moderating the session he has a masters degree in environmental studies from melbourne university and a phd from national university of singapore both on scholarships his research interests are in the field of vernacular architecture cultural landscapes and environmental studies he has been conducting vernacular studio at spa bhopal for the past 9 years and has several publications to his credit welcome sanjeev thank you and over to you thank you neelam and it's a great opportunity uh, to moderate this uh, webinar and with speakers like chitra and yogananda sir uh, who did no introduction if i but as a moderator i have to say a few words about them so i see chitra as an architect by a uh, serendipity who is flowing through life stoically with huge loads of doubts she is a silent worker who has made her mark through her works that speak about her passion passion for eco centrism she has designed and implemented hundreds of real estate developments whether it be residence whether it be institutions whether it be resorts which are guided by ecological principles integrating sound water energy and land use thinking and design she is a very modest person as i know her summing up about her in a single line in short i will say she is a short term pessimist and a long term optimist a short fuzzy human thank you chitra for accepting the invitation to be part of this seminar with welcome i would like to introduce uh, you, uh, dr yogananda sir he is also doesn't need any introduction but i have to say something about him so dr yoda yogananda is a man of alternative ideas if you look at his journey from research in unreinforced masonry walls for his doctoral work to his current practice you will see that he has worked on alternative material and mud is one of them at mrenmai he has been working on mud blocks and other building alternatives his consultancy firm also houses a testing laboratory for technology dissemination he is associated with gramvidya a voluntary organization 
and mahija a consulting firm that works on alternative ideas in architecture and have low that have low carbon footprints and are eco friendly thank you yogananda ji for accepting the invitation to be part of this webinar welcome to you uh the the uh, the webinar will be uh i will explain the structure and then i will go to uh, chitra as the presenter the webinar will be the presentation by chitra on her splendid and exceptional work and uh, followed by a question and answer session by the audiences which will be of 10 minutes and then we'll go on to yogananda sir for his presentation which will be more on the engineering and technology side of that and then after his presentation there will be a 10 minutes question and answer session for the audiences and in the end uh, neelam will be wrapping up the whole session so when we go to mud and see uh, the, uh, the implication of uh, this material in architecture there are many questions that come up to our mind uh the soil type and their architectural application then acceptance of mud as a contemporary material by urban clients about its structural limitations and architectural implications the question of sustainability as a construction material its resilience to disasters its suitability to various climatic zones and many more questions that come to our mind and i know chitra's presentation uh, will be a very uh, giving us all the knowledge about that and clearing our uh, clearing our doubts about mud as a wonderful and splendid material in architecture chitra to you please thank you thank you team i must begin with an anecdote i think my first ever presentation was made in pune in 94 95 and it was for feed in and both professor yoganandan and i were on the platform together so thank you neelam sanjeev sonam to make this happen almost after 25 years it's it's a momentous occasion for me so Uh, i begin by opening my presentation that should be the first thing i should do yeah so what the natural material okay i begin by introducing the road map sanjeev has given to us he has posited some questions and i have based the presentation on those questions I think it was a master stroke by Sanjeev to have already told us the questions because then I don't go all over with the talk and then I don't have to again reinforce the same answers so this saves us time and uh, it also makes me a little more you know bounded by the the conversation so thank you all once again for providing this wonderful opportunity I don't. So the first question was the that mud is mostly assumed to be a vernacular material, and whether that it is whether is it uh, relevant in the cities. I will reply to this with a context, and the context of our city, Bangalore. In this picture. the extents are still shown that of 1973 it has grown much more and it has lost even more than what you're seeing you know 20 years is a long time um it's a short time but it can devastation can happen a lot more and the loss is not just of the green but also the blue and by loss of the green there is the loss of soil too loss of capturing the water loss of biodiversity and more and more generally the increase in population bangalore has gone more than 300 ta- times in population so 300% so it's really grown so how various land use types have 
reduced, which you can see here. More and more construction is only happening. Then we will, we'll have to accept this. We'll have to accept the age of Anthropocene. So now if so much of red, so much of construction has happened, first question one asks is, where does this material come from to build? In most cases, at least till um, five years ago, and even now in many cases, it will be the agriculture field, which would be converted into a brick kiln. You make bricks, get as much soil as possible, which has enough of clay content that it can be fired and afterwards leave the kiln, the land and go away. Even weeds don't grow in it. So while we have devastated the area where we're going to construct, we also devastate through not constructing, but sourcing materials, places which are far away from the... Yes. But here we are discussing mud and mud alone. So we think, what could be done? So as such, we didn't really start with uh, constructing with earth when we started our practice. We were working with bricks. And in 10 years, we saw the quality of brick really deteriorate, the cost of the brick going up and the middle class was not able to afford this. So what we thought is that why are we really going so far away to get materials from? And here was at ISC, Professor Yogananda and his team working a lot on earth construction. And there was this organization called ASTRA, Alternative Science and technology for rural areas, working on earth construction, doing beautiful works. The office was beautiful, we used to go see it. But it was very difficult to convince people. And that was also because of a, not exactly anything to do with anybody else other than the government having done a very bad job of making the Asia's largest mud colony, which was collapsing. So we had a chance to build our house and we decided we'll have a basement. So the whole idea became, why don't we take earth out from below our feet and build with it? And we extended it to the top layer, which is the best layer with most humus, that while we take the earth out from below our feet, we take the humus above our head and grow food on top of it. So we are never going to lose the soil for the best use soil, the best way it can, it's available for us is allowing food to be grown. And if that's a topsoil, that's no good for making earth blocks, so use it above your head. So the soil below your feet for making your building and the soil above your head for your food. So I thought we, we I thought that was a master stroke in terms of sourcing your own material. And we just enjoyed it. So we make a lot of basements. And it's fun to make these basements. This is a basement with skylight. And it's also a performance space. In fact, we have designed about four basements. They're all performance space. I just realized it today while making this presentation. So there is one basement, which is a performance space, or we've gone further. And they're basements with gardens and obviously a well. So now you don't even feel it's a basement because there is a nice garden. And where you can look out and you can go out and play too. That's what Timmy is waiting, rush, wanting to go out. And in larger projects, this is in Coimbatore, a school called Yellow Train, where the whole playground is a basement. It's about one and a half meters below the road level, you can see the road. Because we can't have basements in schools, especially in Tamil Nadu. So we said, we're not having a basement. We, ha we are having a we are having set of classrooms which are below ground along with their playground. And we got so much earth. We could build a building. We could build about the five acres compound wall and enough left for the next phase. So. And here is a school within the city. What 
Sanjeevas, is it possible in the city? This is in Bangalore. Bangalore is a large city, it's the fifth metro. And how did we get the earth from it? For it? From a two lakh liter sump tank, which is in this building, which collects all the rainwater, and that's the water used for drinking and cooking in the school. No other water comes here. And this is about 15,000 square foot of building, built in eight months in the city. Yeah, we have photoshopped away this certain ugly building, so please excuse us that, that it is within the city. So now the second question. Sanjeev asks us is what are the challenges? In articulation of spaces, which I felt is a very nice question because I think we should talk about the space design while we built with Earth, which is certainly different from the way we do with other conventional materials. And what would that be? But first, it comes down to the fact that the practice of architecture itself and the choices we make. So I ask another question to Sanjeev is a counter question, for whom are we designing as architects? Surely many of us are not part of the developer companies which are coming up with high rises. Those developers, the real estate developers will have five or six architects Pardon my saying, but they will be working more like accountants, working out the FSI and how many homes can we get to get the maximum profit, etc. Yeah. So developers are making many buildings, but the architects, there are much fewer in numbers. And they have to juggle to please the market. I agree, it's a very tough ask, task, and but very few are doing. But largely the architects in cities are either designing interiors or designing residences for the super rich. Biome, our office, falls into a category which dreams, which kind of supports the dreams of homeowners who want to make their own house in smallest of possible plot. And those people want an ecological home. They want to bequeath the future with optimism, much needed in these troubled times. So you see the top one, two, three, four, five homes in a line, all about 2,400 square foot plots, with the smallest one being just about 150 square foot, the largest here, about 800 square foot. Now this, this certainly, I have been asked like, how do you run a practice by making homes? Yes, probably I don't make millions, but you know, the satisfaction, I'm sure I'm making a lot of people jealous that I have a street with the same kind of homes. And that satisfaction is just enormous. And this is almost 20 years old, these buildings. Then there are these two friends working at ISRO, building in these two corners. And look at this. I think it's, it's just kind of made the corner of that layout beautiful. And, it, it, and it's also giving a big message that you could live like this. So they're, Besides having built with the earth, they are harvesting the rainwater, treating their wastewater, and you can see that they have solar photovoltaics on top. And this house has a neem tree within its small courtyard, and the plots are just 1,200 square feet. Then here, on a street of 30 by 40 plots, and here is one which is with earth. And it just stands by itself. Then we come to the question that look at 2011 census, which says 80% of India still builds ground plus one construction. So in, there is just no way that you cannot build with stabilized earth at all. If you build 80% of the construction with stabilized earth, and save on cement and paint, unlike these two, 
you have done a huge favor to the ecology and environmental and air quality, water quality, everything. So my first answer to Sanjeev's question of challenges would be do design homes. Homes with earth, homes are difficult projects, but they give you immense satisfaction. So start with uh, designing homes, face the challenges. Second answer is to think of the elements of the space. Think of the elements as they are being the quarry for your material requirements. So where earth is suitable, big or small, bring a basement into the design because that will give you enough and more earth. Where and make a beautiful basement. This is another dancer's studio. Again, you go down, you have a courtyard which brings in light and this is your all of earth. But please do make it interesting. Basement should be beautiful. The worst basement is the basement I made for our house. That was the first basement I ever did and I learned a lot. If you can't bake basements, make ecological pools in resorts. This is a bio pool. So it cleans water by biological processes and gave us enough earth to build the resort which is called our native village and if you are not having a pool dig a pond that will also give you a lot of earth so whether you want to do a smaller construction here it is of our native village which was just about 15,000 to 18,000 square feet of construction I'm sorry, that was about 30,000 square feet of construction. Or you could do larger ones. This is almost now reached 1 lakh square feet at uh, Govardhan Eco Village. All of Earth, this Govardhan Eco Village, these buildings are 10 years old. And a huge credit to Professor Yogananda to have taught us many a tricks, which will also answer the questions about earthquake proofing in mud construction. So this building did that for us. And you can enjoy because you can make lots of textures. So now this is not like, let's say a wire cut brick, it will only look red and boring a brick or stone or concrete, they'll all look the same. But if you use earth, you can make earth blocks, you can make rammed earth, and you can have lots of fun and make cob. You could have your whole office kneading the soil and then making the balls and putting it on top and making cob. And this is a cob construction. Again, in Bangalore, you can see the uh, plot boundaries, ground plus one. And please use RCC slab, no problem. Because RCC slabs are good, especially on top, because you can grow rice on top of it. So they give you a lot of pleasure. And no skills. You just make beautiful spaces. And it's not only walls, you can make beautiful roofs. So that um, on the left is a picture of a dining area for a resort in Kunur. So this is in Tamil Nadu. And on the right is a school, a, an entry space for a school in Tamil Nadu again. But why have gray, boring concrete slabs? Some places can just uplift your spirit and that's a dome with a skylight. So as such, I think more and more what one is coming to say is that absolutely there are no challenges. It just depends upon how you enjoy working with the material and how you enjoy working the profession of architecture. But the best thing is to work with light, which anyways Corbusier and many other modern architects have told us about 100 years back. Yeah? And still you call them modern. So yeah, so it's work with light. And when you work with light, it's just beautiful. You have this tiny living room with a tree growing. And the space is about 15 years old and it's still the same. 
So now comes the two questions more and I hopefully think these are last set of questions by Sanjeev is does mud as a material have limited scope in its use as a modern material? If yes, how low-tech interventions can overcome these limitations? But these two questions have assumed an answer and I hope to go against these presumptions. And I don't want to get into a diatribe of the phrase modern materials and the continued use of the phrase modern because I still feel the use of word modern is obsolete in present architectural schema. So this is our small research. We don't do much, but we also want to be able to talk to people as to why we use mud for construction and why do we put basements. So where the soil is amenable, to use for building because in many places in Bangalore are probably lakes covered with waste so you can't do a basement or sometimes the client doesn't have the budget for a basement and we can't have that so then there is no soil available but what do you do you see the amount of soil available many Amit and uh, I can't read Vasanti's homes have basements and the soil available was about these many cubic meters. But what was required, as you can see, is almost one third and even lesser for the construction above. But there are these homes for Uma, Goshes, and Sheba, which didn't have a basement and they wanted earth. So now, and this has happened in many of our projects that we interlink the two clients. And we take soil from, let's say we took soil from Mini and used it at Uma, the extra soil. And still we have extra soil after that too. So what has happened? It's not only you have worked on a model of self-sufficiency that you have used only the earth, which you got for yourself from your land, but you have shared. So you have sharing of resources happening. And that I find most interesting. It's not only taking only extraction for your own self, but you're sharing. And so the whole goal of making with earth is reached further. And then it becomes that the earth is available for many more people. So the city, now it comes into the cityscape and the city provides for materials for its walls, for its uh, mortar, for its roofs, for its rooftop garden from below its own feet of its residents. And it's not going far for the materials. And that's how we think of a modern material. The modern material, any modern material has to be ecological material because we are in a state of ecological emergency. And it can't be, construction materials cannot be taken so much of embodied energy within them. We could think of wooden, but sorry, it takes for good wood to even let's say neem wood, we need at least 25, 30 years. And that is quite difficult. This is there, right there below your feet available. So this is what has given us. And then it's what it does is we have reduced embodied energy of walls of mini, but add to it that we have also reduced embodied energy of Uma or somebody else's house. So you have reduced embodied energy threefold by one basement, not just of that unit. So look at the large gains which could happen by being with Earth. And so you have to go beyond the object making of your own house. So this is one of our most recently completed project in Bhopal. So this is a frame construction. The plot was of black cotton soil. We had to do ground plus three construction. And, uh, but you know, we obsessed with mud and there was this black cotton soil. What do we do with it? We worked it, we worked, um, I think we did talk to Professor Yogananda and he gave us the idea of mixing 
the black cotton soil with fly ash, quarry dust, and lime. And we worked with people who are making these fly ash blocks, and in their uh, workshop, we made the bricks with the available soil. So I'm just showing this as an architectural possibility anywhere, any material. And again, these are unplastered, unpainted, except for the corner. Corner is where we store paper. This is southwest corner of the building. It was the closest to the gate, nothing to do with Vastu, but it was going to be the hottest corner. So we had to shade it and we've used waste louvers. This is the railway louvers which were available in the Kabadiwala shop. And we picked up, got a framing done and they shade the wall. And now our interest is more and more to use waste into construction. So the buildings become waste sinks. So in, in this country where 90% of the population lives on daily wages, and this has been shown clearly with the laborers, our basic supports walking back, losing everything they had during this COVID times. It's been very clear that they live on daily wages and where the education reach is either low, rather very low on both quality and quantity. Those of us who are privileged should opt for skill-based construction so as to spread the prosperity to a higher level rather than base it on vendor-based. This is my living room. It's about, it's 25 years old. 26 January it's 20, will be the 25th year we moved in. And it does not fail to pleasantly surprise me every day. And also in the new, the possibilities are endless. This is our office. We added the second floor in 2017 and uh, refurbished the first floor on a building which is 20 years old, built with, which is not, I'm saying, uh, this is about 28 years old, built with earth blocks. He was a professor in ISC and he got to know about the works happening at civil engineering department where Professor Yogananda, Professor Jagdish were working and he also made a small house with earth blocks. And the son called us to do addition in the ground floor and add the first floor, which was in uh, 2005. And when we broke the walls, we were most happy to see that it was also earth block. So this is our office. And in no way, using earth blocks has sort of, uh, reduced, ha has been a hurdle for any kind of space making or enjoying the space. So this is the office inside. Um, yeah, green has grown much more now. I hope I have finished answering all the questions. Huh? No, there is one more. Will such interventions lead to structure that is more green and sustainable? Uh, this is the elephant in the room. Yes, of course. Enormous amount of energy, resources, and water is consumed in making much of our construction materials, much of our buildings. So these also create, besides they use enormous energy, they also create a lot of waste streams. The only way forward is ecological. I don't use the word sustainable, we can discuss this another time. So bringing in the issues of water, waste, energy, food and biodiversity, along with crafting spaces, will be the hyper-local design possible. And it's the only way, and that is being contemporary ecological. So I want you all to think of the phrase, move beyond green, move beyond sustainability, move beyond modern, be in the now, and think of the phrase contemporary ecological. So, is there a way we can bring about the change sometimes? The ideas tried are small, but collectively it will have large impacts. And we at Biome are learning from the crisis and trying newer ideas. 
And one of our idea is being smart and smart in the mnemonic sense. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. This is our smart rule. So whether you are an architect, whether you're designing any house, feel free to think of your terrace where you can grow food. Here we are growing rice. You have an eco sand toilet, so you get great fertilizer, your own urine, and the fecal matter as soil. Get your own energy through solar cooker, photovoltaics, or solar water heater. Treat your wastewater on your terrace. Again, in a small plot, the only place where you get the sun is your roof, and don't waste it. Don't leave it boring. So here's the rice growing on top of the terrace. That's the cycle Vishnu got for a web-based competition on the idea of growing rice on the terrace and he received it from Angela Merkel, Premier of Germany. So don't let it be such boring roofscapes. And imagine what can you do? Imagine, this is a huge real estate going waste in our cities. We could fight MOEFF by making our own cities into jungles. So while all this is happening, while we're losing our biodiversity, we're losing our green cover, we have to also be solution providers. We can't always be naysayers. We should be naysayers. I'm not saying anything against the people who are saying no, but let's put in something more for, by ourselves. I want to talk a bit on waste. So going beyond mud, we generate huge waste and it's gone away from in front of our eyes and we don't see it at all. As cities develop, we change our bylaws, we change our FSI or FAR, and so the buildings are broken and then thrown away. So here is a, here is a construction debris, whatever, space, which is almost six floors high. And this is mostly in anywhere where there is a hole where usually water was going and we just lose it. And you can see there's so much material here. You can see there is stone there, you can see earth there. And see concrete there. So can buildings be waste sinks? So one of the easier way was that you can put them in your own construction like this, where you learned from uh, Laurie Baker on use of mango tile, but Bangalore doesn't have so much of waste mango tile. It's a silicon city, so it has waste keyboards. This was before they were uh, repurposing and reusing the waste in a better way, electronic waste, so still it's not that healthy. But buildings as waste sinks. So if you break a building, take them apart, keep them, keep different units, materials, and you can use them to rebuild. And here on the left is a building which we demolished, both of uh, Pratibha and Manoj, the clients were standing. And here's a wall made with their building debris, along with earth. So these are uh, mud concrete walls. Professor, you can correct me. Uh, uh, we, I call Professor Yogananda only professor, so I hope everybody knows whom I'm mentioning. So these are earth walls. They're, they're poured concrete walls, but with earth mixed in them. So poured earth walls. And this is just beautiful. Now this building, which we demolished on the left, gave away all its windows to another building. So the building was not only using its own waste to build itself again, newly, and that's a human right. People would like to have something new. Manod's grandfather had built the house. The house was not so nice that it can be kept. And they wanted a different space. And we're making a beautiful house. All of you, when you come next, we'll go to Malaysia. And this Sanjeev is in the middle of the city a plot which is 50 by 80 feet, but it's right in the middle of city. Very difficult to build, but we're done doing that. And this is without basement because it has its own material. And its windows went to another school we are doing about 
20 kilometers from Maleshwara, it's still in the city. So the building is not only using its own waste, it's also donating its material. So the building becomes a, an organ donor too. So the school is ready. And the third stuff which we are very, very um, happy to be working now is to make the building in the very construction stage, in the very design stage itself, that it's possible to break it, but break it ecologically and reuse completely. Then with this school called Atelier, where every element, every structural element, every every element of the build was designed in such a way that it can be repurposed. So this was designed for only five years of use, though it can last for 100 years if needs to be. But after five years, when the client moves away from that land, he can take every unit, whether it's the roof, whether it's the columns, the walls, the floor, everything with him and reuse it in the same way or in other way. And also can or you can sell off each portion and will make up for the cost of materials which were which he spent five years back. So the flooring here, so this is how it was all decided. Every element was designed to be able to be removable. In fact, the walls here are with paper. So it can go back to nature, it can become good soil. And this is what's inside, an extremely delightful space. The floor is uh, paving, paver blocks placed on um, quarry dust. So five years later, so this should be next year, even quarry dust, which he's paid for, costs about three times now. He'll get everything out of it, including the paver blocks. And uh, this just works well with the with Vastu too. Here the mud blocks which were used were made in another plot where you saw the basement with the, um, the pet dog sitting in the basement. Then the basement was so large that we had lots of earth and we kept making blocks and we kept them at the site because the site around was empty and there was nobody complaining that you're making more than what you need. And we kept it because the contractor knew he's getting this project. So he knew he could make, pre-make extra blocks. So the, whatever little mud blocks we used came from there. So this way, you need to establish connections and make beautiful buildings. So I end with one of our projects, which was built in, about, in 1993, it's 28 years back, where the cost was quite a criteria which we had to really keep a tight leash on. So the first thing we did was that we made the walls thinner. So these walls are just six inches. We learned from Laurie Baker that if you bend the wall, they're stronger. So this is the wall of the right side is the kindergarten. The wall goes up at this side about uh, 14 feet, but there's just six inches. You're turning it and you're making jolly jelly of uh, mud blocks again and the left is a house not a house three houses this is a plot of 50 feet depth and 150 foot length where we had to have a kindergarten and three small homes one of the lady who owns the kindergarten then her sisters two sisters were to be there and the, a, the larger house for the daughter all these in this one fifth, this amount of space, 7,500 square foot of space. And it's just happiest to see that it's still as vibrant as we designed. This is the interior of it and still being used by the children. It's still a very popular school. I end with the quote from Martha Thorn, the executive director of Pritzker Prize, who said that architecture is unique in the sense that it embraces many disciplines in its application and therefore insists that its pedagogy should be beyond space making and look at more. She feels it is the reason that Pritzker is being different now. Globally, there are many big challenges. The world appears to have become smaller on one hand 
yet more complex on the other. There is a need to expand the role of an architect. No other profession has such a broad knowledge and skills to make multiple contribution to the society. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra, for a wonderful presentation and a very thought-provoking ideas which you have uh, shown us and it will definitely play a big role in guiding our young students to visualize and uh, uh, think about mud as a material. Uh, there were, uh, because we have very short time, so I will, I have seen all the questions, uh, I have seen all the questions posed by the audiences. I'm combining a few questions which are for you uh, to answer. The, uh, the question, first question is about uh, is there some kind of a percentage of fenestration through the wall area in a mud, uh, a stabilized mud block or mud blocks? And then uh, can this be used in high rise structures? And uh, cost effective way to make the basements waterproof if there is a uh, way out of that? Then the uh, the climatic adaptation to the extreme kind of climates, like during winters, extreme winters and extreme summers, how this material uh, uh, behaves uh, in in relationship to the human comfort. These are a few questions. There are other questions I think which are more for Yogananda sir. And one more uh, very interesting question is from one of the audiences that uh, he had made a. Uh, mud uh, wall house and it has uh, he is uh, very um, i will say parishan from uh, rodents how that can be taken care of that these are a few questions which uh, the audiences have proposed so i would love to hear from you about those questions <coughs> i hope i remember all your questions otherwise i'll have to open the whatsapp but um, let's look at the, this question where you're saying about uh, high rises. High rises do need walls in between. So you could use thinner earth blocks for making the partition walls. It doesn't stop you from using earth blocks at all. You can, but use thinner ones. Don't make the thicker ones because that will be loading too much on it. So, so that's, yes, even in high rises, because high rises up to ground plus three, you could make with earth blocks itself. There's just no problem. And again, I think Professor Yogananda will be better to tell you, but this is the most versatile material. This material itself by, especially when you're talking about CSE based, compressed stabilized earth blocks, by changing the amount of uh, stabilizers you put, by designing the element, you can design how much load it takes. And you can't do that to a brick. It just comes whatever. So whether the brick takes 35 kg per centimeter square, even for a load bearing wall and even for partition wall. Here while as you go up, you can reduce the amount of cement fuel. So this is best. So it can be used up to ground plus three, but always note you're not making ground plus 20 stories anyway, so many. Work for people who made ground plus one, ground plus two, ground plus three buildings. And uh, the, uh, you'll have to ask me the questions again, or I'll have to open it on this. But about the rats, I'm, I, I really can't do anything about it. Rats are there everywhere. The rats are there. They usually the latest um, National Geographic. There are more rats in the city than some of than the population, the human population. So. It has nothing to do with, uh, and that's in New York, okay? There are more rats than, uh, uh, than the number of people in New York. And uh, that has nothing to do with earth construction. I think this person is a farmer, I kind of read his note earlier. So the idea would have been to have a, a little more higher uh, plane. And if you notice, our vernacular buildings never had plants near our buildings. They kept it far away. I have all the kind of uh, 
plants growing up on my terrace and I know rats walk there. So it doesn't matter. A bit of rats is good because if you notice, they will take care of the other animals which would otherwise come to you, come on to you. They then remain on their bodies. So please see rats also as part of the ecosystem. So ideally clean your surroundings, keep them away from plants and food materials, you'll have less rats. What were the other two questions? I'm sorry if I missed it. Yeah. Sanjeev? Sanjeev, you are uh, mute. One, one question is about resilience to disaster. How mud react, reacts to the disaster in terms of earthquake resistance or uh, in terms of uh, 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 harsh, very really harsh, uh, disastrous. So earthquake resistance, there's just no problem. You design for earthquake resistance. So don't yes, I have, I have seen uh, vernacular architecture in the hills of Himalayas where earth has been used, rammed earth walls have been used and they have stood the earthquake. Uh, yes, so what do we have to use for earthquake, earthquake prone regions? It's not really only the walls, but also the roofs. It's yes. the bad buildings which kill the people, not exactly the material. So what we have done in Himachal and other areas are that we replaced simple bamboo earth and slate roof to RCC. So which, when that collapses, yes, disaster is, fatalities are much higher. Whereas if a bamboo and earth and uh, little slate tiles fall on your head, you really probably will not die. So look at that as a detail. Don't uh, start only looking at one material. So there are ways of designing and the ways of, uh, there is need to question also, do we really need to build there? Why are we building in such places? And then there is, it's not, everything need not be on a building. Look at the whole ecosystem. What happened in Kodagu was that we've cut land and landsliders occurred. A building couldn't have helped the, family of the priests. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the uh, presentation and it was very thought provoking. I will now uh, invite uh, Dr. Yogananda, who, is, uh, who will be uh, making his presentation. And Dr. Yogananda, uh, uh, when we think about mud and when we think about it as a material and its properties, uh, there are a few questions that come to our mind, uh, like properties of different types of soils, which uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, Chitra has also talked about, and their potentiality as a building material. Then about the structural limitations, which I think you will be able to explain how it can be fused with modern material and the structural limitations can be overcome. Uh, its resilience to disaster in terms of their structural limitations. And uh, again, uh, from a civil engineer point of view, how we will react to uh, this material being used in high rise. And, and final question will be uh, what I feel is the, how does this material position this material for in the future? Uh, over to you, Yogananda sir, uh, for your presentation. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thanks, everyone. It's nice. Uh, as Chitra remembered, I also remembered our Pune visit. Uh, yeah, without uh, wasting much time, I will get into the presentation. This is uh, basically sharing of our experiences for the last four decades. So, to begin with, uh, I would like to share some earlier, uh, you know, structures which were built. This is uh, an example in 1948. 4,000 houses were built using cement stabilized rammed earth in Karnal. We recently visited. So these are recent pictures. They're all quite happy with it. It's about 15 inch thick rammed earth. This was uh, during the partition. There was an urgent need for housing and there was no way they could have uh, 
made burn bricks to the kind of requirement they had though this was thought of as a, an excellent uh, uh, possibility and uh, some with some initiative from the uh, pwd and uh, other uh, professionals this was done this is something which is to understand that uh, there were earlier examples then coming to bangalore 260 houses were built in bangalore few of them near jainagar and a few of them near the railway station even today there are few houses near the platform road near the railway station where people are still living these were uh, hand ramped soil cement blocks uh, you can imagine now you can calculate how many years it is now so we are in 2020 so more than 70 years so many a times longevity is uh, something which is questioned if some minimum maintenance is taken care of the building is, buildings will last and if at all uh, buildings are pulled down today mostly because of the lifestyle changes and things like that so it's possible to maintain most of these buildings and uh, it will work for us as long as we want when we don't want we demolish it when we, if we don't maintain it probably it can become a conservation project for some people so i will move on to the uh, experiences we have had in asra indian for science see uh, from 1948 or 49 to almost uh, 1970s that is 70 four astra got established with the initiative of professor amulya and uh, professor jagdish uh, was our uh, team leader trying to look at alternatives in housing likewise there were several other scientists in universe science looking at other issues related to uh, alternative energy renewable energy biogas and rest of them so in 1976 professor jagdish built a biogas lab which is still there in the iic campus and Astra office complex in 1985. This is where we participated in an activity of research and development, trying to understand the soil and come up with solutions. Because unless there is a research support, the technology will not uh, progress. That is the reason why you, you can see a gap from 1948 to 1976 when the biogas lab was built. And of course, it's a learning process we continued learning and the kind of experiences we have had in uh, our research activity in uh, asra uh, is something which i would like to talk about because today we talk about carbon dioxide emission there are uh, you know you often hear reduce your carbon footprint environment friendly go green save earth i don't know how do we save earth earth will take care of itself we have to save ourselves probably prevention of global warming, sustainability. So all these words are there, but it is very important to understand these words. Otherwise, they may not carry much for us to take it forward. For us, during the 70s, it was embodied energy. That is something which uh, we were very keen on trying to look at. Uh, an alternative for the kind of materials we have been trying to use and can we reduce these material consumption like burn bricks consume four megajoules per brick you can see cement and steel consume quite a bit of energy glass consumes a lot of energy i really don't know why people use so much of glass uh, in a place like uh, bangalore if you have too much of glazing you're going to heat the building and Imagine you, you air condition these buildings and you use more electrical energy to, you know, reduce the temperature inside to make yourself comfortable, so-called comfortable. So these are all probably the kind of questions we should be asking while designing. We try to look at embodied energy and try to see what does a building material, which, uh, you know, is not at all considered as a uh, subject to be discussed in our uh, uh, educational uh, system, whether it is engineering or architecture. Stabilized mud techniques, I would say, there are many possibilities in terms of techniques. I'll come to it later. 
as an alternative to burn brick is something which you can try to look at cement stabilized or lime stabilized or a combination of both in small quantities we can produce these blocks there is no burning we can reduce the embodied energy 70% or less than 70% less than the burn brick plastering and painting not required good wet compressive strength and durable we can make it you know excellent quality blocks with this uh, kind of a process burn bricks from a plain uh, molded uh, you know mud uh, brick green brick or whatever you go through the process of burning and then come up with a product which is good uh, in terms of resisting moisture which has wet strength whereas plain mud when you immerse it in water it will have no wet strength and it has only dry strength that is something which we should understand so we are talking about stabilized mud here so if somebody is listening they should understand that we are talking about stabilized mud wherein we talk about wet strength not the dry strength so embodied energy in buildings it is very very important to understand a frame structure you know if you look at the footing column beams and slabs and whatever walls come up they consume about 2 to 2.5 giga joules per meter square of the building the built up area whereas in a load bearing masonry structure it comes down to half of that which is very clear that we need to revive load bearing masonry buildings i don't have to uh, you know say more than this it so happened that in 1987 i had an opportunity to look at uh, my own house construction and it came naturally to me to use stabilized mud blocks in my house exposed masonry of course and uh, i started making blocks uh, at the site when i had lot of onlookers visitors and that is how i started interacting with so many people very informally when i completed in 1988 then many approached me for advice and that is how mrinmayi started in fact i never uh, thought i will quit iac and start a consultancy firm like mrinmayi to take these ideas forward but it so happened i think i should uh, say that people in bangalore actually took me uh, away from iac and i started nunmai uh, in 1988 that's also the time when hadco they started uh, looking at mud seriously and they said mini mud revolution and took my house photograph and they kind of you know uh, printed it in you know most of the newspapers and magazines it came up uh, and also festival of france in 1988 89 again took my house as an example and they showed it uh, so in the exhibition so these are some of the things which people started taking it seriously and munmai this is our office building it shows the potential of masonry you know it's very very important to look at how well we can utilize this masonry we are talking about stabilized mud block we can have arches walls we can have domes we can do carbelling we can have parapet walls staircase railings so several of them this is a three storied uh, office building for us we built it in 1994 uh, we have the testing lab wherein we have tested several soils the left side shows a simple uh, test in terms of understanding the sand content in a soil which we do it for every soil what we get we have got soils from all over india and abroad also so this is a very simple test to understand how much sand it has because we need to look at a sandy soil for stabilization on the right you can see machines these are manually operated presses a sister concern of mrinmayi mahimaya trying to you know make these excellent quality manually operated presses for making these blocks and uh, the person whom you see there i fondly remember his name is krishna he was instrumental 
in doing excellent job understanding the mission he's no more with us but his memory lasts forever and uh, all the r and d work carried out at astra department of civil engineering has been the foundation for all of our activities here it's very important to understand how do we look at wet strength of the blocks there is a code for it one can refer it you should immerse these blocks in more in water for 48 hours see any material any masonry unit whether it is burn brick or concrete block or a clay block or a laterite any masonry material whatever you are going to use there is a method of testing that you have to saturate it and then you have to load it in a testing machine and crush it and understand what load it fails and then interpret as mpa or newtons per millimeter square with the codal provisions the minimum strength what is required for any building is 3.5 and depending on the uh, proposed building the strength requirement will change and similarly the mix proportion will change so the whole idea of this laboratory was to arrive at the required mix proportion depending on the strength requirement as far as the manual press is concerned uh, it has spread all over india and abroad also lot of appreciation for the simple mission with a simple investment of about 70 to 80000 it can generate an employment for eight people this is something which is very very important in the present day context employment generation with minimal investment mechanized press block there have been some requirements we have been able to custom make mechanized press blocks the one what you see is a semi mechanized press block wherein only the compaction is by hydraulic then recently there is a uh, completely automated factory producing mud blocks they produce excellent quality blocks recently we tested you get about 10 mpa strength of the block they make bigger size blocks 12 by 9 by 4 so there is a very opportunity for people to utilize these uh, Uh, possibilities and ready made blocks are also available in bangalore one of the uh, very very uh, what should i say close to my heart uh, activity is training artisans so i look at livelihood as a priority so interestingly if we travel around and when we talk about people working on daily wages i think unless we take care of them and build their skills skill development is another very very important thing i don't think uh, we are doing justice to our job so training artisans has been a priority in munmai so in kutch after the burj earthquake we helped abiyan now of course you know unarshala unarshala started after uh, the earthquake when uh, the earthquake happened i was also there during that uh, you know uh, chaos i was in a part of kutch and i was a witness to buildings falling down due to earthquake so after that we trained many of the uh, artisans in the villages and they built bungas for their own uh, requirement these are 15 feet diameter round houses in fact form also plays a very good role in resisting earthquake round structures definitely have more resistance compared to other forms this is after the tsunami again we were there training people you know to not only make blocks but also build earthquake resistant buildings this is something which is very important today because we don't know uh, you know whenever you go to a new area you should try to understand what zone it is in terms of earthquake and try to incorporate the earthquake resistant features so mason structures can be happily you know can be happily adopted to earthquake resistant buildings there are uh, elements which go into a mason rebuilding like the plinth band the sill band the lintel band and the roof band and tie them with some vertical reinforcement also you will have a masonry building which is earthquake resistant so it's after uh, 2015 earthquake in nepal again there was a request 
Sudhakar went there and uh, we trained people in making blocks. So these are all what is happening, which is like on the job training, which is very, very important today. And we conduct hands-on workshop. This is something which is very close to uh, what I feel, which is very important. So we conduct one day hands-on workshops. Very soon we will announce one day hands-on workshop. Wherein, you know, the participants will have a, an understanding of how to make a block. What are the issues? How they should, uh, you know, uh, touch the soil and feel different kinds of soils and understand. We also conduct a three-day program, extensive uh, three-day program involving all the techniques of alternative ideas, including the roofing techniques. As you can see, vaults, domes, passive solar architecture uh, issues are also discussed. We will come to probably the different techniques, what I will be probably sharing it with you. The first one is, of course, the stabilized mud block. Rest of them we will uh, discuss as we go uh, through the presentation. So, stabilized mud block making process, you know, is shown in this uh, slide. You have to see the soil, you mix it with uh, sand like material or right amount of moisture to get a semi dry mix, and then weigh the mix to get a good density. This is very important, and then pour it to the mold, then compact it and eject it and stack it. Stacking is also one should stack it close to uh, the uh, other block so that there is not much of drying so that uh, the blocks get cured properly and you need less moisture to also cure them. So quickly, if we go about different possibilities of uh, blocks, you can get interlocking blocks also you can make, but I don't think there is much benefit out of that. It is just an attraction. You can make, of course, different uh, uh, filler blocks, cornice blocks, corner rounded blocks, pigmented blocks and all. Pointing is very essential as we don't want to plaster the building because it's really not required. One can go for group pointing or flush pointing. Now, this is an example which has a basement also with mud block. Then you have a ground floor, first floor and a provision for one more floor. Almost this is a four storied structure. Then TVS Bricks India in Sholingur, they have a foundry unit where they, where, you know, where they have this return sand. A lot of return sand comes as a waste. They don't know what to do with it. So we use that return sand in the blocks and uh, uh, that was used in constructing some of their buildings. So this is very important. Today we are flooded with waste. It's important to look at how do we utilize them in buildings. Buildings can definitely be the best option wherein you can utilize quite a few waste materials what we generate. This is an example of Nirmiti Kendra Bangalore Rural District. This is a government building. So a load bearing masonry to store it building. Incidentally, we had an opportunity to help uh, uh, people involved in the Nalanda University. So this is an expansive soil. The local soil is like a black cotton soil and uh, they wanted to use this for making mud blocks. So we had to mix a lot of sand-like material and lime and cement combination with surki to change the color. The surki is nothing but the burnt brick powder, waste brick powder. If you mix it with this, you will get a better color. So that's the emblem which they gifted or presented to us. So there is so much possibility. As we are discussing about black cotton soil, we can also look at, there are many other types of soil, acidic soils, which demand lime as a stabilizer along with cement. There are organic soils. It's better not to use them. They're good for agriculture. Grow whatever you want with this topsoil. Go down as Chitra was also pointing out and then use that soil, which is good for buildings. Rammed earth. Well, this is another excellent, uh, the process is similar mixing and everything. You can have different kinds of molds, a smaller mold or a bigger mold. After the 2001 earthquake, you know, the Abiyan NGO, where they, when they were involved with uh, the construction of bungas using rounded technique, they had a mold for one uh, full structure. It's a complete 
15 feet diameter covering that uh, perimeter of the wall. So two days the uh, walls were up to seven feet and they could put a roof. And of course, it has earthquake resistant features, plinth band, lintel band, and seal band also. This is something I would like to share. This is, I have a very fond memory of getting involved in this building with Chitra, uh, where we tried the ram dirt with a smaller mold, this for Professor Raj Gopal, a two-storied ram dirt structure built quite some time back. This is one of the recent uh, ram dirt building which we built. Then you can see stabilized adobe or carb. This has an excellent potential. In fact, there are a lot of soils which are highly clayey and it is difficult to sieve them, process them. You add water, age it, and you can mix it with cement and lime, pug it. You know, process of pugging is the crucial thing. Once you pug it, you put it into molds of whatever size you want, demold it on a good surface, you can have various shapes of blocks. This is something which is very, very uh, important today. We have an example of 2010, one stabilized adobe house. There have been several examples, another one in Coimbatore in 2018. This is again with Chitra from Biome, which we did uh, three-story stabilized adobe building in Bangalore. This is something which, uh, it totally means it has the potential. Of course, that is the integral. Again, an exposed masonry. Then yoga and meditation center in MCE Hassan, which we did. We did it for a pyramid structure also using stabilized adobe. These are chamfered stabilized adobe blocks kept in such a way that you get the angle of the pyramid. Then this is the yoga center. We have been involved in one of the eco uh, resort in Madhya Pradesh, Survahi, wherein the local skill is the cop skill. So we didn't want to change their mode of uh, uh, work. It's a cop technique. So building has come up with the stabilized cob there. Then mud concrete. Presently, I think mud concrete has excellent potential because we, we have, you know, come across in most of the urban cities that people demolish the building. Uh, even 20 year old building is demolished. They don't know what to do. They throw it on any low laying area. Even water bodies are converted into land. Uh, fields and you know you reclaim the land. So that is the kind of situation we have. So any old building demolished is a resource for a new building. This is what we have been involved in recently. So you can make precast mud concrete block or cast in situ, both are possible. These are some of the examples what you can see. This is another interesting uh, building which came up recently in uh, Sitilingi, Tamil Nadu. There was an old house uh, that got demolished for various other reasons. So we recycled all the material back into the new building as mud concrete. The school building, see near uh, Sitlingi village, it's a tribal uh, remote area. There have been a lot of uh, well digging happening, open wells for agriculture purposes. A lot of well extracts in terms of stone was available. So we made use of the local soil and this waste coming out of this well uh, digging process and school buildings were built. These are all in situ mud concrete buildings. This one happening in Hoskote near Bangalore. It has an RC slab, mud concrete precast uh, blocks. Thank you. I think I've been able to complete within the given time. Now uh, I, I request you to take it forward. Thank you, Dr. Yogananda. Uh, this was, there, it was very informative and I think uh, the audiences will gain a lot of uh, uh, insights in this. And uh, I was looking at the questions posed by audiences. Uh, they, they have certain concerns about uh, soil uh, being used in construction if there is a kind of a met, uh, metal contamination in it especially lead. How do you react to that? In our experience, we have not encountered that till now. In, in our four decades of experience, okay. uh, we 
we have not uh, faced that problem. The only issue generally what we talk about is the organic matter in the soil. Generally, the topsoil has organic matter. We tell them, don't use the topsoil, utilize it for what, what is good for that. So below six inches or one foot, you can try to use. Maybe Chitra is trying to add something. Yeah, so um, lead contamination, I don't know how it's coming. You have to check that. But ideally, if you don't go about licking the wall, there should be no problem. Lead paints used to affect children only because they used to lick the walls. And that had to do with certain uh, issues with their food itself. No. Their nutrition. Uh, if you look out that, you don't, you don't have to lick the wall. Okay. Uh Okay. Another of the audiences uh, had uh, mentioned a problem. He had uh, used mud blocks and in his one of his projects. And there was a shrinkage in the uh, walls uh, after some time. So he had asked how to overcome that. See, very, very important factors if you want to produce a stabilized mud block. Is one is the strength. The other one is the durability. Both go hand in hand. So the mixed design plays a very important role. This is the only reason why I have Nunmai a testing laboratory to provide solutions as to what should be done with the kind of soil and how much sand has to be poured, what other uh, materials are available, resources are available in and around that area. We can come up with a good mixed design to help them so that durability issues are addressed. Okay, so uh, uh, if you look at various uh, soil types hmm? yeah. and uh, the stabilizers which you use, so is it uh, that uh, it is very specific to the site or in general if you take a black cotton soil or uh, uh, any other kind of soil type uh, and you fix up a formula or kind of a percentage of stabilizer and the ingredients into it or it is very specific to the site. Okay, then probably I will have to get into what is soil. Okay, what is soil for us? You know, physically, if you try to look at, it is silt, clay and sand and gravel. That is what is soil for us. But there could be impurities. There can be so many other impurities also. So. One of the things which is very, very important for stabilization is to use a sandy soil, wherein the sand content in the soil, when we test it in the lab, if we have about 60 to 70% sand in the soil itself, then it can be utilized as it is without any modification of the soil. Otherwise, let's say, for example, if the soil has more clay and yeah. less sand, then we need to modify the soil first. And then it becomes acceptable for stabilization. So if you look at uh, some of the soils available in uh, highly clay area, uh, you know, where the clay content is very high, we need to dilute the clay. So which means dilute it by sand-like materials. It can be quarry dust or sand if it is available uh, locally at a lesser cost. So these are all possibilities, but Coming back to the type of soil, if it is an if it is a acidic soil, it demands lime. You know, even in agriculture, they use lime when they want to grow something in acidic soils. Cement is something which gets utilized along with lime. If it is a black cotton soil, lime is the stabilizer, which is very, very important. In addition to that, cement gets added to get early strength gain. That is what we did for Nalanda. So solutions are there. But we need to understand soil because it is very complex. Soil is very complex. Without testing, we cannot guarantee anything. Uh, a uh, few uh, audiences have asked about the uh, uh, Chitra, please. Yeah. Chitra. So I, I want to come from the architecture side and I want to insist that uh, we need collaboration. We have to understand the value of collaborating with somebody who has a knowledge of this. So, yeah, Professor Yogananda does it for all over India. And you can also talk to certain uh, engineering colleges and understand the soil, though I think best is to get to Mrinmai. But understand that the fact that as architects, you may not know about it. So it's always be open to learn 
and understand your soil. So please reach out and learn about it. These yeah. here, the webinar, it can't be understood. Yes. You have to collaborate. Yes, definitely. Definitely, and you have to collaborate with the specialists and uh, understand your soil first, and then you have to uh, de define the proportion of the stabilizers, and then uh, that will be a right way to go. Uh, I, I in one of your presentation, Yogananda sir, I saw a blue colored uh, mud block. What uh, I do? <laughs> can we add uh, uh, colors to it also? Yeah, natural see, colors are wonderful, but I saw the a uh, blue colored. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, these have been some, some requirements which came from the people who were involved in that construction. They wanted like 100 or 50 blocks which are pigmented. So you can add any pigment and try to get the color. It is possible like any of the oxides. For example, aluminum factory, you know the bauxite, what they use for in the aluminum factory, they have a waste called red mud. So they have to throw it that red mud can work as a pigment. So many of the waste from factories can also work as a pigment. Uh, it's possible. One can look at uh, that possibility also if that is a requirement. So do Otherwise, you have any idea how many colors we can uh, achieve from various... Uh, uh, yeah, this has been in the recent past, people have been pressing for color, color, color. But I have never encouraged them. I say, you know, just use the soil naturally, whatever it is, it's better that way instead of doing anything else. But there is a possibility, there, there is a potential. That is what I can tell you. You can get different colored uh, blocks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yogananda and Chitra. I, I really appreciate the, the presentations were lovely and they were very thought provoking and a lot of insights our audiences might have got from your presentations and uh, uh, I will request uh, Neelam now to take over and uh, I, have to, yeah. I have to only add one more thing yeah uh, you were talking about high-rise buildings yeah yes, yes. okay if we travel around travel to UK go to US Sweden several places even in India, Bombay, you have load-bearing masonry structures which are high-rise. If that is required, there is scope. Structurally, we can design it. There is nothing which prevents us to design a load-bearing masonry high-rise. You know, you have 22-story high-rise building in US. So that was before they started doing the frame structure. They are all very old, functioning very well. UK also, you have it. So there is nothing which prevents us from building a high-rise building, but is that required is another question one should ask. And if it is really required, you know, it is possible to design it. Just because we are, we have the capacity capacity to design, should we do it? Is the question. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Neelam, for the yeah. wrap up of the entire webinar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, before I start the time giving, I would like. Uh, um, both of you, Yogananda sir and Chitra, to one message to the viewers, if you have. Well, I have one. Yes, sir. Uh, can we build less and plant more? Great. Yes, trees, I think, they are the best sustainable in the long run. And Gramavidya, you know, that's what Professor Jagdish is doing. He has a small two acre land. He is only trying to look at different species, local species, and trying to plant them. So he says, after uh, my death also, the trees will remain. Anybody can utilize it. So like this is what a lifestyle was earlier. People used to plant trees, and next generation can utilize. So we have to keep that in mind. Can we build less and plant more? And most sustainable that will be. Yeah, thank you, sir. Chitra. Well, yeah, I, I agree, build less. I don't think we can because we really need a lot of infrastructure. But I think most important is that we build equitably. The way we are building right now is not fair. So the resources we have to really consider as whom does it belong to? It can't be 
right now only certain people take all the resources and i'll just add one more thing yeah i'll just add one more thing see the kind of concerns which you generally uh, have is even if there is no need many times larger buildings get built so need based construction is what probably i was meaning not in the sense <laughs> build less so need has to be understood more because we really don't know our needs and wants so where do you draw the line you know where the wants start where the need stops so that's it yeah chitra sorry you went out yeah so that's what uh, anyways gandhi has also said that we have enough for everyone's need and not for one man's greed so that's the gandhian philosophy <laughs> yeah and i think it makes a lot of sense and especially at these times i think we should also look at how much we can share in terms of what we build we have taken from somebody else and it's not just ours yeah thank you so much i think that was uh, and uh, i think i also started my journey on mud with dr yogananda and i think that was in 2007 2006 2007 and i took a five day training program with uh, gramo vidya uh, before i started my house so that was a really uh, again for me also a very great experience and you know i have never done this with you professor i have to <laughs> do a workshop <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i i should say that i enjoyed your presentation i think uh, that's something which is very important for an architect to that's why i felt always an architect has so many uh, you know things to come together you know to ultimately give it to somebody you know a lot of things come together so that's very nice i have a lot of appreciation thank you thank you thank you everybody thank you all for listening so i'll just uh, wrap up <laughs> um, in this time of materials being loaded for being more and more synthetic and processed you both have brought respect to this material by mainstreaming it in the construction industry thank you so much yogananda you. sir and akri chitra for sharing your works and your most valuable experience Thank I thank director professor Kalra Dalbag Education Institute Deemed University Dalbag Agra and their department of architecture for partnering as our institutional partners I thank dr Sanjeev Singh for moderating the session so very sensitively I thank architect Geeta Geeta Varakrishnan and architect Sonam from Ethos and ASH for their support in hosting the uh, webinar Our sessions are to bring information to the common man in the most simple manner, who is often misguided and confused by the consumer-driven media, media ads by celebrities and the words of university. I heartily thank all the participants for actively participating in the webinar. We will be sending out a combined poster for the next three webinars on bamboo, traditional construction. Uh, techniques and building with natural materials see see you all of again all of you again uh, in the next webinar and thank you so much thank you sir thank you chitra thank you sanjeev thank you so much hey nilam okay thank you very much yeah, bye thank you thank bye you. chitra bye yogananda bye. sir bye thank you bye bye, bye. bye.